All right, forget about circuses. The greatest show on earth is politics. Monday afternoon, the Senate began debate on the Pain-Capable Unborn Child Protection Act, where after 20 weeks, nearly five months in the womb, the child would be protected from late-term abortion as it would be prohibited under the measure. Now, I'm not surprised that some Democrats disagree and they want to keep the U.S. up to date with the laws in China and North Korea where this type of late-term abortion is legal. But truly amazing is Senator Ron Wyden arguing against the pain-capable unborn child protection act without using the word unborn, child, baby, or even the left's favorite term, fetus. Ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, this amazing display of avoiding the actual topic and wording of the bill happened on the Senate floor. Here you go. Mr. President, the odds are quite good that when this Republican-controlled Congress closes up shop in December, time spent attacking the health care of women is going to be right up at the top of how this Congress spent their day. They're back at it again, and this latest attack that we'll be discussing this week goes after women's essential health care decisions. In my view, and I want to be very clear about this point, Mr. President, this is another key part of the Trump agenda of health care discrimination. And this time, it's going after women, and this entire agenda is what the Republicans are doing their best to blast through the Congress into law. It's not just a one-off, either. So I'm going to spend a few minutes now to put this particular health proposal that discriminates against women in the appropriate kind of context. And to do that, I think it's important to describe what has happened on health care since day one of the Trump administration. The administration and Republicans in the Congress came right out of the gate with legislation that would have deprived hundreds of thousands of women of the right to see the doctor of their choosing. There was another attack on Planned Parenthood that completely ignored the fact that the Congress already regulates what these trusted health care providers can and cannot spend public funds on. What Planned Parenthood does use public funding for are vital health care services that have absolutely nothing to do with abortion. Let me just make sure people understand what I'm talking about. We're talking about cancer screenings, prenatal care, preventive services, routine physicals, and more. And, Mr. President, we have town hall meetings in every county in our state. Had more than 860 of them. The vast amount of terrain in Oregon is rural. And when I go to those small communities and the least populated of our state, that's what people tell me they go to Planned Parenthood for, is to get those basic essentials ranging from cancer screenings to routine physicals. So that's what women would lose with this Trump agenda of health care discrimination. Next up, given the way the year and a little bit longer has evolved, was the ongoing attempt by the Trump administration to deny women guaranteed no-cost access to contraception. Now, this is one of the most popular health care policies in recent memory. And there's a lot of reasons why this is smart, not just because it's a matter of fairness for all women to have access to birth control. When women have access to contraception, it means healthier pregnancies and healthier newborns. 
It also reduces the risk of cancer among women. You can also look at it in terms of dollars and cents. When you take away no-cost contraception, you're essentially taxing women based on their gender. You're driving up the cost of their routine health care. It flies in the face of everything my colleagues on the other side of the aisle say about the problems of health care costs in America. So those are strikes one and two, denying women the right to see the doctor of their choosing and making it harder for them to access contraception. Now the Senate is debating whether to throw a matter of settled law out the window with a hyper-partisan ban on abortion after 20 weeks. My view on abortion throughout my time in public service is it ought to be safe, it ought to be legal, and it ought to be rare. And I have supported a whole host of policies that bring both sides of the aisle together. The President of the Senate, for example, is fairly new to the Senate Finance Committee, and he's uh, looking to be involved in a host of issues. My guess is he'll be very interested in the adoption tax credit kind of concept, which I and others have championed for some time. That's something that brings both sides um, together. So my view is abortion, safe, legal, and rare. Find ways to bring both sides together and respect that the federal government ought to leave women alone on these most intimate decisions that involve women, and their spouses, and their health care providers. The proposal the Congress, the Senate is now debating is all about telling women what they can and cannot do. It criminalizes health care services that ought to stay between women and their doctors, health care services that are often necessitated by potentially life-threatening complications. I just, for the life of me, don't see the wisdom of a lawmaker or a bureaucrat in Washington, D.C. or a state capitol telling a woman how severe the danger to her life has to become before she is legally allowed to make this invariably gut-wrenching decision to choose an abortion. This issue has been settled law in America for 45 years. The debate should be over, but here it is again, along with these other policies that I've just described are part of the Trump administration's health care discrimination agenda, which is particularly punitive against women. Let me also, you know, recognize that the biggest victims under this discriminatory agenda are women who walk an economic tightrope every single day. If their local Planned Parenthood clinic is forced to close its doors, they may not have the ability to take time off work and travel long distances to see another provider for routine health care. They already balance every day the food against the rent, the rent against electricity, electricity against gas. Take away these choices, like no-cost contraception, you make their struggle to get ahead that much harder, especially when the rate of unintended pregnancy is five times higher among women living in poverty. You've got folks who may not be able to afford a plane ticket or even a bus ticket to somewhere where they can find the essential health care services they believe are necessary. There are serious, genuine health care challenges that face the country. Millions of Americans get clobbered every single time they walk up to a pharmacy window 
and get pounded by the cost of prescription drugs. That's the kind of bipartisan debate looking for solutions. Another example, the opioid epidemic raging from one end of the country to another. More than half a million lives lost in the last two decades. Countless families and entire communities torn apart. The Congress and the Trump administration hasn't done nearly enough to fight the crisis, and frankly, not anywhere near close to what was promised in the fall of 2016. Instead of taking on these challenges, the Trump administration and Republicans in Congress are just full steam ahead with this agenda of health care discrimination. This week, an attack on women and their health care choices. Passing this bill is going to make it harder for women to be in a position to make the health care choices they believe are important, may be essential for their lives, and I urge my colleagues to oppose the bill, and with that I yield the floor.